Professor Yuan, please go ahead. Thank you. So can you see my screen? Oh, yes, I can see the screen. Okay, uh, first, thank you, Professor uh, Penzhen's uh, kind introduction, and uh, I'm very honored to uh, have the chance to uh, introduce our uh, recent works in the algorithm hardware co-design for the deep learning in the seminar. And uh, so first I would like to apologize that, so uh, you have listened to my, uh, my provided abstract, uh, but in my presentation, I actually, I uh, switched the order of the, the two parts. I will introduce the sparsity part first and then the low rank part. <laughs> and uh, so- um, Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So uh, today uh, I would like to introduce the, the algorithm hardware co-design for energy efficient deep learning. So, so uh, in the recent uh, uh, four years, so my group, we did some the exploration uh, along these directions. And so we now we know right now the artificial intelligence and especially the, the deep learning or the so-called deep neural works has uh, is reshaping the world. We already witness many exciting the news and reports like the AlphaGo and the, the recent Alpha Fold to, to predict the uh, uh, folding arc, uh, structure of the protein. And also like in the classical artificial intelligence field like the, the OpenAI's GPT-3 can, it's very huge model and it can uh, produce the article that is uh, the, we, can, we are, very, it's very challenging for us to distinguish that uh, it is uh, the article written by a, a computer program, and also in our current daily lives. So, so deep learning has been widely used in like in the autonomous driving and so on. So right now, this is, this phenomenon technique has been used in many many exciting and impo important applications. Uh, but however, from the perspective of the, the practical applications, we know that so executing the deep neural work is actually is a very costly, it's very expensive. And this is because the, uh, by their nature, the, the deep neural works, they are uh, both storage intensive and computation intensive. So for example, for the GPT-3, so this is a very huge natural language processing model. It, contain, it contains the more than 100 billion parameters. So it is very huge. And also for those that the uh, deep neural works used in the computer vision domain, maybe they are not so huge, but they're also very computation intensive. Like in the ResNet 152 from the Microsoft research. So it is contained to process the one image. It need, it need to consume the more than 11 giga operations. So here each operation contain one multiplication, one addition. So have, this is a kind of very extensive workload from the perspective of computing hardware. And uh, so this type of the, the storage intensive and the computation intensive characteristic, it posed a very severe challenge on energy efficiency. And uh, so such energy efficiency challenges both for either at the edge end and the cloud end. So for at the edge end, for those that the low power devices like IoT devices or the mobile platforms, so due to the limited progress of the current battery uh, technology, so if we directly run those to the computation intensive neural work on the at the edge, so the battery will be quickly drained, and so th that will uh, severely affect the user experience, and also for the cloud end, so the power consumption or energy consumption is also a very big concern. So for example, for the Google's uh, first generation of their AlphaGo, they run that on the more, uh, nearly 2000 CPUs or nearly 300 GPUs. So the electricity bill for one game is more than $3,000. So that is a very huge cost, operational cost, even at the cloud end. And uh, so also, so in the current uh, in emerging uh, green energy and green computing era. So the energy cost for the and the corresponding social impact for the deep learning deployment become uh, even more important. And uh, so, for example, for some that the research uh, research uh, outcome from uh, from the University of Massachusetts, they uh, analyze the training cost for even train a single natural language processing model. So they found that the, the 
the carbon emissions can be as high as the five cars in their life uh, in their lifetimes. So that is that means that the training the deep neural model is also very very energy consuming, and it can cause the very severe uh, environment impact. And even worse, so because uh, in the artificial intelligence uh, uh, field, so we will continue to scale the deep neural work. And this is because if we want to pursue the, the higher accuracy, so we need to feed more data to our model. And uh, correspondingly, the model size need to, be, need to be scaled up correspondingly to avoid the underfeed problem. And in that case, that means the corresponding storage cost and computational cost will be even higher. And actually that trend has already been reflected in different uh, AI subfields, like in the computer vision field. Uh, so the uh, scale of the, the convolution network becomes larger, uh, larger and larger. And the recently for the, for the recent emerging vision transformer, they, are con they, are, uh, they use a different structure of, from the convolution network, but the motor, motor size is even bigger. And also for the natural language processing field, so we already witnessed the development from the GPT-2 that only has the 1.5 billion parameters. And it already developed to the GPT-3, that is more than 100 billion parameters. And the such trend uh, is still continuing. And uh, actually just the last month, the Microsoft and the together with the NVIDIA, they just announced a new generation of the natural language processing model. That is the, uh, contains the more than 500 million parameters. So we can imagine that. So if we want to deploy that model, even at the cloud end, that is a very, very huge cost for the storage, for the memory footprint and also for the computational power. And uh, if we want to further utilize such model at the edge, so uh, it is kind of very, very challenging task. So that is caused the demand for the efficient deep learning. And actually this demand, it, it has crossed the entire spectrum of the, the AI. So from the very tiny embedded end and to the mobile end, to the edge and to the cloud. And actually, the, right now, there are, there are already many, many explorations and works try to uh, realize the efficient, efficient learning at the different uh, position of the, the spectrum of the AI. Like, for example, in the embedded end or the mobile end, the Google they pr proposed the TensorFlow Lite, that is the uh, a platform that can be fit to the different uh, embedded devices. And uh, also in the mobile end, there are, there are also many other solutions and many startup companies right now they're working on that. And for, for the cloud end, the efficient uh, uh, operation, uh, deep learning in the data center is also very hot topics in the computing community. Okay. So, uh, in general, so we have the, the two uh, avenues towards the efficient deep learning. And the first one is that to how to develop the compact model. So that is more on the algorithm side, how to optimize the model to make them compact, more lightweight and more efficient. And uh, typically we have the, the two type of the methodology to do that. One is the model compression. That is what I will uh, introduced in this talk. And another is that the neural architecture search, that is to use the neural work to find, to search, to identify the suitable, suitable neural work, neural work model in the practical applications. While for the model compression, that means that we already have a pre-trained model. For example, we train a model in, at the cloud end. And now we want to deploy it at the edge or at your mobile device. So how to efficiently compress that without the accuracy loss? or with very minor accuracy loss. So this is the uh, approaches and solutions at the algorithm side and on the hardware side, so we can further to design or, or implement some of the customized hardware that is specialized to suitable for the deep learning workload. 
And for example, a very representative and well-known effort is from Google. They, they design, implement, and fabricate their uh, specialized tensor processing unit, the TPU, used in the Google's their own data center. So right now, every time when you use the Google's, uh, Google service, so actually many of their service, they run in the TPU. And for the customer hardware, so we also have the two type of different solutions. One is use the traditional classical digital CMOS. And that is also what I will introduce in my talk. So how to design the CMOS based hardware design for the deep learning. And the second is using more analog uh, emerging technique like the MAM resistor or the MRAM and, and, uh, and also many in-memory computing uh, technique to do that. And uh, so in this talk, I will introduce the, the more, uh, more about the digital CMOS part because this is the kind of the more practical and right now the commercial uh, available technique that we can directly use to accelerate the deep learning model. So first, uh, regarding the model compression, so in general, we have the, the three different types of the, the model compression approaches. The first is the specification or so-called pruning. So the key idea is very intuitive. So when we have a dense model, so we want to remove some unnecessary or the less important weight or the filters or the channels, and then to specify the entire model to make them more lightweight and to reduce the computational cost and the memory footprint. And the second uh, commonly used technique, especially in the industry, is the quantization. So that means that because so for the deep learning model, when we store them in the computer, in the hardware, so actually for each weight, we need to use the, the limited number of the, the bits to represent it. And uh, because of the inherent fault tolerant characteristic of the deep learning, Actually, we can use the, the much fewer bits instead of the, the standard 32 or the 64 bits to represent to represent each weight. And for example, we can just use like the two bits or the one bits or the eight bits. Eight bits is kind of the standard setting right now in the industry to represent the each weights. And then the corresponding entire model size of the, the neural work can be linearly reduced. And for example, in Google's TPU, they use the eight bits to, to store the weight of the deep learning model. And the third commonly used model compression techniques is the, the low rank decomposition. And this is based on the fact that the, each layer of the, the deep neural work, it is either of, of the, the matrix or the, the tensor. So in that case, we can try to explore the, the potential low rankness uh, of the, the model, and then to reduce to to decompose the, the each huge layer to the to the two or more small matrix or tensors, and then we can we can enable the, the reduction in the model size and the computational cost. And uh, in in this talk, I will briefly introduce so our recent exploration on the specification part and the low rank part. And so these two, these two type of efforts, they can actually, they can be further uh, combined with the quantization and to, to, in, to enable the further uh, efficiency improvement. So here is the uh, overview of our algorithm and hardware co-exploration. So actually we try to explore along the two different uh, directions. The first direction is to explore whether the model is dense or sparse. And the second direction is the whether the model is structured and unstructured. And here the structured and unstructured, that is very, very important when we try to deploy the deep learning in practice, especially in the off-the-shelf hardware. And so along these two directions, actually we explore the four subfields. Uh, so the, so when the model is a structured dense model or the structured, sparse model or the unstructured dense model or unstructured sparse model. And for these four different uh, sub-directions, uh, sub so we performed both the algorithm and the hardware co-explorations and, 
develop the corresponding algorithm to optimize the deep learning model size and also develop the corresponding specialized hardware accelerator to support uh, the acceleration and the low power execution of those optimized models. So first, uh, I would like to introduce our works from the sparse perspective for the efficient deep learning. And uh, right now, the sparsity that is actually is a very, very important property that we can leverage to optimize the model. And uh, actually, so the, just the last month, the Google, they announced that they are the next generation of the AI tech architecture infrastructure, the pathways. And according to the Jeff Deans, the uh, a very famous the Google uh, head of engineering, and um, one very important optimization point for the pathway that is to explore the opportunities brought by the sparsity. And this is because the today's model actually is kind of very dense. But uh, in practice, so we don't need a such dense model. Both for the sparse, uh, both for the data processing part and the storage part. So, actually, if we can efficiently explore and, and leverage or to create the opportunities from the sparsity, so then we can significantly improve the, the performance of the, the AI uh, system. And so, actually, inspired by this uh, very obvious advantages, so. Uh, my group, we studied the different type of sparsity across the entire spectrum of sparsity. So in general speaking, so, so for, the, uh, for the deep learning sparsity, we can roughly uh, div divide, it, divide it to the three categories. The first is the so-called software-friendly structure sparsity. And uh, in this case, the sparsity is kind of the structured one. But it is actually it's the friendly to the software, only friendly to the software. And for, for example, when we have the, the weight metrics for one layer of neural work, if the, the, the entire rows of entire columns, they are the sparse, they are the all zeros. And in that case, when we want to execute such kind of the, the models on the, uh, on the off the shelf, the CPU and GPUs, so we can, observe that the measurable speed up. Okay, and that is very important if you want to execute those the models, um, like especially like, like the mobile phone that which right now is still not equipped with the specialized AS accelerator. Okay, but the uh, drawback of this type of the software-friendly structure is that, so typically it will suffer a small accuracy drop and the sparsity cannot be very high. And this type of structure, the sparsity that is right now is kind of the focus in the deep learning, the algorithm community. Okay. And the second type of the sparsity is also kind of structured sparsity, but we call that is a hardware friendly sparsity. And for example, so we can observe that we can still have some the spatial pattern existed in the weight matrix, but in such cases, if we directly execute such that the hardware-friendly sparse structure sparse models on the off-the-shelf off the CPU and GPU without any hard modification or without any specialized compiler, so you cannot observe the speed up. And that means that if you want to leverage such the structure, hardware-friendly structure sparsity, you must design the specialized hardware or de de uh, design the specialized compiler to support it. And that is called the engineering efforts, but the benefit is that, so the extra drop is kind of becomes minor and the, you can further uh, achieve the higher sparsity. And the last one that is kind of very more general sparsity, that is so-called unstructured sparsity. You cannot find the uh, spatial pattern for the, for the zeros in the weight layers. And so this is a very general sparsity and it will not uh, cause any constraint for the end users. And the good thing is that, so there will be no extra drop. And if you want to use such kind of sparsity, you can achieve very, very high sparsity. And that means that theoretically you can gain a lot of the speed up 
and uh, uh, and the model size reduction. But the drawback is that for such kind of sparsity, you cannot directly use. You must design the specialized hardware accelerator. And uh, actually, that is the right now many uh, startup companies working on the AI chips. They are working on to design such the specialized chip to support such unstructured sparsity. Okay. And first, for the such software friend structured sparsity, and my group recently proposed the. Uh, a new algorithm for the channel pruning, that is the very commonly used the, uh, software reference structure sparsity. That is to, and this type of the structure sparsity is, has been extens extensively studied in the deep learning community because it can bring the measurable speed up on the CPU and the GPU. And the key idea actually is quite very simple. So for example, for convolution neural work, so we just, uh, during the inference, we can just remove some unnecessary channels and filters. And then to, uh, and how to how to how to uh, remove which channels should be removed? So we need to determine their importance to calculate their importance score, and then to determine which channels should be removed. And in our recent work, we proposed the chip uh, algorithm that is the channel independence based the pruning method. And our key idea is that to identify the linear dependency among the, the different feature maps that is output from the each filter. And we, we observed the linear dependency of the feature maps to then to derive the imp importance of the, the each filter and then to perform the pruning. And uh, so here we actually, we use the nuclear norm, the change of the nuclear norm of the, the feature maps. And then using this change to determine which feature maps is less important. And then we can further determine which channels should is less important and then we can remove. And the reason why we use nuclear norm because as compared to the rank, the nuclear norm can better reflect the linear dependency or the, in, or the independency change when uh, before or after and after we remove the sound feature maps. And is it because this kind of the soft information, so it's rich, it can provide more rich information than the rank. And uh, so that's the reason why the nuclear norm is a better criterion to do that. And uh, here's the pruning performance of our approaches. So you can see that, so using our, our nuclear norm based pruning criterion, so we can achieve that a better uh, compression ratio and the better accuracy improvement as compared to the state of our work. And uh, the second work of our exploration on the sparsity part is that the, on the hardware friendly structure sparsity. And here we actually, this idea actually is inspired by the communication side and uh, from the history of the LDPC code. So we know that LDPC code right now is widely used especially in the 5G. And uh, during the development history of the LPC code, so actually uh, in, the earlier, in the earlier years, so the, so the information scientists, they studied the so-called irregular sparsity of the edge matrix of LDPC codes. And so the irregular sparsity can bring a very high coding gain, uh, coding gain, but from the perspective of the hardware decoder design, the net is not hardware friendly. And then uh, we gradually shifted to the use of the regular sparsity that is also right now used in the 5G standard. So for the regular, so for the regular LDPC code, so we can observe that. So in this edge matrix, actually it is composed, it consists of multiple sub matrix and each sub matrix, it is used to kind of the shifted or the permutated pattern to introduce the regularity, spatial regularity. And inspired by this phenomenon, so actually in the deep learning model design, we also introduce such the permutation based sparsity. And uh, so using based on such the permutated sparsity, so we can develop the structured sparse models. And this is a very hardware friendly and, uh, and also can still maintain the high accuracy. And we develop the corresponding hardware accelerator and uh, implemented using the 28 nanometer CMOS technology. 
And here is the, the accuracy performance. We test that across the different data set in the image classification data set or in the language translation data set, we can find that. So we can achieve the good compression ratio uh, without also with very minor accuracy loss. And also for the hardware performance, we compared with the, the very seminal sparse DNN computing hardware, we can find that we can achieve the very small area. And uh, also in the area efficiency, energy efficiency and the speed up, we can achieve the very significant improvement across the different workloads. Uh, and for the third uh, unstructured sparsity, uh, we also explored the corresponding efficient hardware accelerator. And for the unstructured space, it is actually from the perspective of hardware design, this is a very challenging task because we need to properly utilize and leverage both the dynamic input sparsity. That typically is from the ReLU layer of the neural model. And also the model sparsity, that is when we want to prune or, or specify the model itself. That is a static sparsity. So how to properly leverage them together and to without any over a computation overhead and the storage overhead, that is a very challenging task for the computing hardware community. And uh, right now there are already many uh, prior works uh, working in these directions, but for the state of art work like the Spartan extensor. So uh, a very key missing point is that, so they still suffer the many unnecessary non-zero data transfer. And that means that even so the computation is kind of very compact without any redundancy, but the data transfer, it causes the unnecessary energy consumption. So that is where it caused the a huge energy overhead for the entire deep learning accelerator. And to tackle this problem, so we propose the GoSpa, a global optimized SPA CN accelerator. And our key ideas compared to the previous work is that, so we first identify that actually we can pre-calculate the sparse information to avoid an unnecessary data transfer. And also we can use the predefined non-zero non weight and non-zero activation pairing knowledge to identify those the non-zero pairs. And this is the very key part for all the existing sparse uh, DNA accelerators, how to properly identify the pair of the non-zero weight and the non-zero act activation. If we cannot do that in an efficient way, we will pay the, a lot of the cost for the data transfer and the computation. And uh, we are the first work that we can, we identify that actually this pair information can also be predefined and pre-calculated using a very efficient way to do that and then can significantly save in the entire hardware cost. And uh, this is our performance information. So as compared to the state of our works, if we do not consider the off-chip DRAM, so we can achieve the two to five energy efficiency improvements. And also as compared to the other work that include the reporting the DRAM access, like the very seminal MIT's IRIS and IRIS V2 designs, our work can also achieve the very high improvement on the throughput and the, on the on-chip or the system, entire system energy efficiency and the error efficiency. And thanks to our efficient sparsity handling pers uh, processing scheme. And uh, so next I will uh, introduce our another direction of the, the exploration from the low rank perspective. So the low rank is, is another very important opportunity that we can leverage to optimize the deep learning model. And uh, for the low rank needs, actually we can either explore the, the low matrix rank needs or the, the low tensor rank needs. And the corresponding that means that we can either use the matrix composition to compress the deep learning model, or we can use the tensor decomposition to compress the model. And in our work, we mainly focus on the tensor decomposition. 
This is because in many important deep learning models, especially for the convolution neural work, so the, the layer actually it mathematically is in the 4D weight tensor format. And for the classical metric composition, they must first flatten the tensor to 4D tensor to the 2D weight matrix, and then to perform the to perform the decomposition. But that means that you will lose the very important spatial information. So while the tensor decomposition can directly operate on the tensor space, so we can maximize the information preservation. And also the tensor decomposition, based on uh, the very element, elegant uh, pro mathematical properties, we can have the very high comp compression ratio and also potentially have the high accuracy. So that is the reason why we mainly focus on using the tensor decomposition to optimize the deep learning model. And especially so we are very interested in the tensor train decomposition. And this is the, the relatively the more advanced tensor decomposition approaches. And uh, uh, it, the key idea is that it can decompose the, a, tensor, a large tensor into a set of the, the small scale the tensor cores. And the number of parameters can be then significantly reduced. So for example, so for many deep, deep learning layers, especially for those are very large layers. So when we use the tensor train, so it can bring the very high compression ratio, um, more than 1000 times uh, model size reductions or layer size reductions. So that is very, very attractive from the perspective of the, uh, practical deployment, especially so considering right now, those the deep learning model become that, uh, larger and larger. But however, so when we directly use the, those the tensor decomposition approaches, so we are facing several challenges, both for the computing side and for the accurate side. And the first challenge is that the redundancy, computing redundancy challenge. And uh, that means that if we directly use the, the tensor train decomposition for the model compression, so actually, yes, you can obtain, you can gain the very high compression ratio, but the penalty is that actually you will have the very high computational cost overhead. And this is because the naively used tensor train, it causes a very high computation redundancy. The number of multiplications will be even, high, even higher than the, the one that you do not use any model compression. And this is because the, model, the computational redundancy existed in the tensor decomposition. And to achieve uh, to solve this problem, so we proposed the TIE, a tensor train post inference engine. And the key idea is that we propose a very compact computation scheme. We can significantly reduce the redundancy existing in the original processing scheme. And for example, for the one layer in the VGG16 model, we can save the more than 1,000 times multiplications. And in that case, actually, we can indeed saved the computational cost after the compression. And based on this scheme, so uh, here's the example of our computation scheme. And uh, based on this scheme, actually we, in, we developed the corresponding hardware accelerators, contains the two type of SRAM, the weight SRAM and the activation SRAM. And uh, this, and the, we, uh, implement a design example using the 28 uh, CIM, uh, nanometer CMOS technology. And we have very conservative design strategies. We only use the 16 bits the aggressively to reduce the bit width to get the even smaller uh, chip, uh, chip area. And here is the layout of our design and it can achieve the, the one gigahertz uh, clock frequency, frequency <clears throat> clock period frequency. And also we compared this with the uh, state of uh, the seminal uh, deep learning accelerator, like compared to the EIE, so we can achieve the good air efficiency and energy efficiency. And also as compared to the RES, that's a very seminal convolution network accelerator. We can also achieve the uh, linear increase in the throughput, air efficiency and energy efficiency when we, when we implement on the under the same CMOS technology. And actually based on our techniques, so a team from the Tsinghua University of China, they actually fabricated one chip uh, using the emerging technology in-memory computing. 
And uh, they actually they reported their result in this year, the ISSCC, the top uh, chip conference. And the second challenge of our uh, of the, the tensor decomposition based deep learning model is the accuracy loss. And uh, this is because the, the right till now, so most success of the tensor decomposition, tensor train decomposition is on the FC layer, like in the existing uh, recurrent neural work or the LSTM or the recent the very, very hot transformer. But for this type of the, the model, typically they have the very high redundancy. So actually, uh, when you use the tensor train decomposition, this is a very aggressive compression strategy. You, you don't suffer the huge extra loss. But when we apply it directly, apply it to the convolution layer, so, or the convolution neural work, they are more compact. And in that case, that the accuracy performance after using the tensor decomposition is kind of not comparable to the pruning method. And to address this problem, because the convolution neural work that is widely used, especially in the embedded system, like in the smart camera, in the autonomous driving and so on. And that in order to solve this problem, so mathematically, we uh, develop a formulated optimization framework to perform the uh, low tensor rank decomposition on the convolution neural work. And actually our key idea is that we do not directly perform the decomposition. Instead, we utilize the ADMM optimization technique to gradually impose our desired low rank structure on the model. And then, so we can make the model gradually show the, our desired low rankings. And in this way, using such very smooth procedure, we can, we can ensure that we can, uh, after the comp compression, the model can still achieve the very high accuracy. And this framework is a very general and for any low rank decomposition method, no matter use the SVD based metric decomposition or the different types of tensor decomposition like the tensor train, tensor ring, Tucker, CP and so on. So it's a very general solution. And here is our performance. You can see that as compared to the state of art pruning method or the existing matrix decomposition or the tensor decomposition method, so we can we can achieve the, the better accuracy, and uh, and achieve and as well as the, the the higher compression ratio. And also we can apply this to the recurrent neural work for the video recognition dataset. And again, as compared to the prior tensor decomposition approaches, we can achieve the higher accuracy and the, and the more compression ratio as compared to the prior work. And so the last part, I will give a brief introduction on our prior work on the low displacement rank. So low displacement rank based model optimization. So low displacement rank is kind of the more general uh, property for the metrics. And uh, so the key idea is that, so we can build a deep learning model using the different type of displacement rank metrics like the circular metrics and topics metrics and so on. And to utilize, they are provided a spatial pattern. Here, the spatial pattern is the, based on the dense format instead of the sparse format, and then to reduce the memory cost and the accelerate the computational cost. But uh, to uh, accelerate the compute, the compute, uh, the the, compute, uh, the, uh, the computation speed of the, the hardware accelerator. And uh, so, basically, the, the, there are different type of low displacement rank metrics and. Um, like the, the circular metrics, the topless metrics, Wonderman, the Hankel metrics, or the Corsi metrics. And the low displacement, uh, for low displacement LDR metrics, it is not necessary as the low rank metrics. Actually, we can further extend the use of the low rank method to the low displacement rank method. And uh, so based on this work, uh, based on this, Idea actually, we already developed a framework ranging from the theory to the hardware design. So, for to provide a theoretical guarantee and the corresponding model training and, infer, in, and inference algorithm and the de developed uh, develop method for the design space exploration and build a hardware architecture and implement on the FPGA. And also, there's a team from the Tsinghua University two years ago, they followed our 
work and they fabricate a chip using the in-memory computing to achieve very high uh, performance, the DNA accelerator chip. And uh, so this is our implementation on the IPGA using the circulant, but very probably used the low displacement rec metrics for the speech recognition. So you can see that as compared to the prior work on the, under the same data set and the, and the quantization scheme. So we can achieve very similar performance, uh, accuracy performance and uh, reduce the seven times latency, 20 times increase on the throughput and a 10 times increase in energy efficiency. So that shows the very attractive uh, uh, performance for the practical implementations. Okay, so I think I'm running off time. So here's the summary of my talk. And uh, so actually, so the efficient deep learning, we can explore from different perspectives. We can use the, the algorithm to optimize the model, to design the customized hardware accelerator to achieve the speed up. And also we can, so on the model side, we can either explore is the, the very attractive the sparsity or to explore the potential low rankness to reduce the computational cost on model size. And actually, based on these different perspectives, we can observe the many interesting inter intersections, like to the whether model can be built structured or unstructured, whether you want to improve that from the algorithm side, the hardware side, the sparse side, or the dense side, or also like you want to do the classical hardware or using the emerging technique, like the in-memory computing or the memory store to build a hardware accelerator, to build a deep learning accelerator. Okay, so actually there are still many opportunities that we can explore here. So at the end of the, my talk, I want to also to, introduce, to have a very brief introduction of a, a, a seminar right now we are organizing the in the Rager. So this is a Rager's Infusion AI seminar. And uh, we hold this seminar every fall, spring, and the summer. And so we invited the, the, res the researchers in both academia and industry to introduce uh, their recent work on the deep learning, efficient deep learning, and not, not just deep learning, also on other AI techniques uh, to from both the algorithm side and the hardware side, the, the software side and the system, entire system side. So, uh, so here's the, the, uh, <clears throat> the website of this talk. So you, and this, talk, uh, this seminar is, is, is open to public and you are free to attend this seminar and to ask questions to our speakers. And uh, typically this seminar, in this fourth semester, we have it every Thursday morning. And also, we record all the talks in the uh, in the YouTube, and uh, so you are you are free to watch them if you cannot attend this seminar. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. So thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yuan, for the for the very interesting and uh, informative uh, talk. Uh, hold on, let me stop the recording first.